Olá pessoal, tudo bem? Meu nome é Jonaína, eu sou engenheira eletricista e trabalho na Virtual Cai com dinâmica veicular e desenvolvimento de novos negócios. Eu vou introduzi-los aí neste webinar, produzido em parceria com a Try Testes e Simulações e, claro, com a Mechanical Simulation, do grande professor Dr. Thomas Gillespie, especialista e autor do livro Fundamentos de Dinâmica Veicular, bem como o Dr. Michael Sayers, CEO e responsável da área de tecnologia da Mechanical Simulation, que irá apresentar posteriormente as principais novidades desta versão 2019.0 do CarSim, do TruckSim e dos demais softwares desenvolvidos pela Mechanical Simulation. É, mas antes de passar então a palavra para o Michael, eu quero apresentar brevemente a Virtual Car e a Try Testes e Simulações. É, nós ficamos aqui em São Caetano do Sul, São Paulo. A Virtual Car, então, trabalha com a comercialização e desenvolvimento de softwares, prestação de serviços de engenharia e geração de inovação na área de CAI, Computer Aided Engineering, utilizando a simulação virtual para gerar produtos superiores aos nossos clientes. As nossas soluções, elas se concentram em alguns pilares. Nós podemos citar, então, a questão física do produto, de diagnóstico e prevenção de falhas, durabilidade, qualidade, confiabilidade e redução de massa, soluções voltadas à conformidade e atendimento de normas e legislações, soluções de tecnologia e inovação e soluções de cunho financeiro do produto, né? voltados aí à redução de custos. Uh, nós também, aqui nós demonstramos bem a nossa sequência de atuação, né? Então, a partir de um problema, uma necessidade ou uma oportunidade de melhoria, nós atuamos no respectivo setor e encontramos a melhor solução para o cliente. Estes são os softwares com os quais nós temos parceria, então todo o portfólio Siemens que diz respeito à simulação CAI, como o SimCenter, FEMAP, Star CCM, o Optimus da empresa Noises para otimização multidisciplinar, FEMFAT, análise de fadiga, CULI, gerenciamento térmico, LS Dyna para análise de impacto e segurança, os produtos da Mechanical Simulation e o Virtual Pikes, que é o nosso software desenvolvido 100% aqui e voltado aí à otimização topológica. Né? Aqui nós ilustramos os trabalhos que nós realizamos, então nós atuamos bastante aí na parte de análise estática, linear, não linear, dinâmica, análise de escoamento de fluido, análise de tombamento, ROPS, FOPS, né? dinâmica veicular, claro, é, transformação de processos, viabilidade, estudo econômico na troca de materiais, doing, design of experiment para otimização de variáveis e fazemos também medição experimental, né? acelerometria, extensometria... Por último, aqui então, a inovação. Né? Nós trabalhamos com materiais avançados, como aços de alta resistência, alumínio, aço inox e compósitos. Também a questão da eletrificação, que é um assunto bastante discutido hoje em dia, refrigeração de baterias e sistemas autônomos. Né? E a manufatura aditiva, com o Design for Additive Manufacturing, criando um componente ou um sistema já destinado para a manufatura aditiva, tanto em polímero quanto em metal. É, e aqui são alguns dos nossos clientes, então nós trabalhamos aí em diversos setores da indústria, na área acadêmica também, podemos citar o, o MIT, né, um dos melhores institutos de engenharia mecânica do mundo, que utiliza o nosso software, o Virtual Pikes. É, esses aqui são os nossos parceiros, destacamos aqui o LS Dyna da Alemanha, Noises, Bélgica, Magna, Áustria, temos parceria também com o grupo de alumínio e aço inox, compósitos e aços de alta resistência, né? alguns órgãos importantes de pesquisa e desenvolvimento como Senai, FINEP, CNPq, FAPESP, também parcerias comerciais aí com a Force e com a Try Testes e Simulações, né? 
a Try aí que está conosco neste webinar, representando também a Mechanical Simulation, é, oferece assessoria, execução e equipamentos para testes de engenharia e simulações para toda a indústria da mobilidade, né? atuando aí então na parte de dinâmica veicular e CAI em parceria conosco, assessoria empresarial junto com a Piratiani, desenvolvimento de empresas, né, na parte de certificações em parceria com o IKEA, Instituto da Qualidade Automotiva, e na área de testes aí com seus provedores específicos, certo? Bom, eu já vou deixar aqui também o meu contato, agradecendo aí a participação de todos. Durante a apresentação, nós vamos estar aqui por chat, então podem tirar suas dúvidas, podem nos mandar comentários, perguntas, e também depois este webinar vai ficar disponível para vocês, e nós estamos à inteira disposição aí por e-mail, por telefone, então fiquem bem à vontade para nos contatar, certo? Muito bem, é, eu vou fazer uma breve introdução para vocês, mas quem irá apresentar esse webinar será Michael Sayers, ele é CEO e responsável pela área de tecnologia da Mechanical Simulation e ele irá listar os novos recursos dos produtos da Mechanical Simulation nessa versão 2019.0. Né? Será organizado em sessões com base nos principais componentes do software, então vão ser abordados tópicos referentes aos novos modelos de veículos disponíveis as melhorias no sistema de suspensão, aumento de combinações de eixos, agora até nove eixos para veículos comerciais, e a grande novidade dessa versão, que é o suporte a motores elétricos e powertrains híbridos. Então, além de diversos sensores para testes ADAS, sistemas avançados de assistência ao motorista para veículos autônomos, é, também sensor de estabilidade contra capotamento, melhorias no controle de velocidade, melhorias nos modelos de pneus, freios, powertrain, é, aumento do número de trajetórias para 200 tipos de trajetória, além de 100 pistas diferentes, uma incrível melhoria da realidade virtual e a possibilidade de interface para diversas aplicações, como, por exemplo, hardware in the loop, né? Então, eu passo agora para o Michael Sayers para ele dar continuidade, então, à apresentação. A gente fica à disposição aqui pelo chat, ok, pessoal? Uh, this is Mike Sayers. I'll be making the presentation. I'll be going over the new features in our, uh, our vehicle dynamics products, car sim, truck sim, and bike sim. It was released December 18th. We've been doing this a while now, and uh, there are two big complaints that you users have about our software. The first one is that it's too complicated. All those parameters, thousands of outputs, nobody understands the whole thing. Can't we make it simpler? And the second problem, except for whatever my interest is, my specialty. In that case, it needs to be more comprehensive. Can't you add more detail? So these conflict a little bit. Uh, Just so you know, our approach is that we make system level models. Our goal is to have the model reproduce results that you would measure in the field in terms of getting the vehicle motions in response to what a driver does with steering, shifting, braking, uh, gears, uh, throttle. They're parametric models, so it's easy to do uh, variabilities and sensitivities. They have to run fast. We support all these real-time platforms and typically a uh, Carson model will be 15, uh, sometimes even 20 times faster than real time. But because we don't have the detail that you want in your specialty, we have many means for extending the models, which I'll get to later. Our models are thorough. We have all the 3D connections for the suspensions and uh, using rigid bodies, brake systems with lots of options, steering, I think we have uh, eight combinations of model options for the steering system. Our built-in tire model is, is pretty thorough, plus uh, you'll see that we support many external ones at powertrain aerodynamics. And uh, something that we introduced a year ago is modularity in car sim and truck sim. That's opened up 
a lot of opportunities that we're starting to show off here. Now, when we introduced Carsim 18.0, uh, Carsim, as you may know, supports trailers. You had, a, in our GUI, a choice of a trailer with one solid axle or a trailer with two solid axles. Our solvers actually supported a lot more options when we became modular. We now just have one Carsim uh, DLL that plugs in, and then you pick and choose which options you have. In 18.0, you could do a three-axle trailer, but it was hard. Now it's easy. We've, we're looking at the uh, trailer screen up here. So this is a new screen that supports three axles. They can be any combination of solid or independent. In TruckSim, there's almost endless opportunities. These are some uh, examples that I showed uh, almost a year ago. In TruckSim, the top one is a guy with nine axles. There's a tritum and three, tri three uh, tandem suspensions in there. The one on the bottom has a tractor towing 16 semi-trailers, combinations of dollies and semi-trailers. We, we support these, they run and uh, surprisingly, they run pretty fast. Both of those models run about two times faster than real time on a Windows machine. When we went to this modular concept in 2018.0, we were uh, all trying to address uh, the need to have a more accurate or more representative model for twist beam suspensions. And there was a working group with four Japanese OEMs that Dr. Watanabe from Mechanical Simulation uh, was part of that. So the, the change is basically that we extended our old independent suspension model so that instead of having function, uh, 1D functions in there like toe versus jounce and camber versus jounce, we made them 2D functions. So it's toe versus jounce on this side and then possibly another independent variable would be jounce on the other side. If you don't have the data for that, they re revert to, two, to 1D tables like we've always had. But now they're 2D tables, so we can get some interactions that uh, quite easily just taking the KNC data that's generated routinely. And if you don't have uh, KNC data, we, you can use something like Suspension Sim or Atoms to uh, replicate the, to do the detailed model and replicate the KNC test. Uh, the result after a year of using this has been real positive from the uh, members of the working group. Uh, they're finding good agreement between the uh, proving ground results and the CARSIM results. New for 2019.0 is a degree of freedom that uh, some of you asked for uh, that has not just vertical dynamics but also longitudinal dynamics. And this goes into ride applications. So the um, it's a generic suspension where if you hit a bump, the uh, longitudinal deflection is not quasi-static, it's actual dynamic. There's uh, uh, It's got the mass and we have a stiff, nonlinear stiffness and uh, I think nonlinear damping in there that uh, will give it true dynamics. So we're not really sure how effective that is. We'll be looking for feedback from those of you who want that, uh, who can exercise that feature. Here's a summary of some other new features. I'll be covering the first two in more detail, but beside the, um, so going to the third one, we've made some improvements in our speed controller that it uh, more accurately does what you want it to do. Some minor improvements in the tire models, brakes, powertrain. Uh, when it comes to ADAS applications, I'll be talking about all the paths and roads that you can have. So we've increased the number there, so we can have 200 paths and 100 roads. Uh, we have a feature for linearizing the model, generating A, B, C matrices that can go into MATLAB. And we also support a restart thing where you can jump back in time and continue. As the models have gotten more complicated, there are were, there were some edge cases that these didn't work properly. And that's been completely redone for CarSim and TruckSim and will be done in, for BikeSim in the uh, future releases. OK, the uh, hybrid powertrain. This is where we are using an internal combustion engine and an electric motor with a battery and a generator and planetary gear set to uh, connect them. In 18.1, we shipped CarSim with a 
Simulink example right here that we're looking at. This was generated by researchers at the University of Michigan uh, and validated using some test data they had. We took it and cleaned it up, um, made it a little bit robust for handling cases like being stopped and uh, some rapid changes. As you can see, it's a complicated model, but it uh, it does it did match. It's, it's kind of a Prius style of uh, sharing the, the resources. It has a controller over here, internal combustion engine, generator, electric motor, battery, and a planetary gear that connects them. And then this is the Carson guy down here. Now what we've done for the 19.0 is take those equations, the model, and build them in. So now we've got the engine electric. So here's, here's the engine model. It's just like we've uh, always had. And here's the powertrain assembly. So we have the battery, the engine, generator, motor, planetary gear, some parameters uh, involving the planetary gear and just uh, summary information, and then lots of tables that have nonlinear relationships. If we go up and uh, that's the assembly, the power management, also is built in, it has a new screen that's basically telling whether the internal combustion engine should be powering the wheels or uh, generating, recharging the battery or, or maybe turned off. And this also has just lots of tables in here. Or not a lot, two tables. So how does it work? Well, first the efficiency. Uh, this time now instead of running five times faster than real time, we're going ten times faster than real time. I'm I'm sorry, instead of twice, so it's five times faster. Uh, Simulink was really slowing it down. This means our twenty-some urban cycle uh, simulation is going to be done in a little uh, in about two minutes. And these are the kinds of results that we get. Uh, this is the cycle up here as the speed is going over that period of twenty minutes. Then we're getting information about the battery and the efficiency, fuel consumption, things that you're interested in if you're using a hybrid simulation. Okay, the next topic, uh, the next improvement is to build in uh, electronic stability control. We've had uh, examples doing this with VS commands. Now, since they've been required by law for cars uh, since 2012 and in trucks for a, a, just a few years. Uh, we're putting this in. It's a simplified version that's similar to our uh, ABS controller for brakes. So here's an example in truck sim. This is a simulation of a truck making a step steer. The, the steering angle just goes up as a step and there's a, a slight instability. Uh, watch carefully and see if you can see it. Yeah, that's it. So now we'll look at it uh, with the controller on. Okay, we see the uh, icon, the uh, stability heads up display coming, and it uh, goes through the maneuver without rolling over. That's good. We got the uh, controller algorithm from uh, one of our customers, a, a truck company, to use in a driving simulator. So it's been cleaned up, so it's uh, fairly generic and easy to apply in different applications. It's predicting what the yaw rate and the lateral acceleration will be. So you can see here that when the yaw, predicted yaw rate, uh, which is in blue, is small, it's off. When it climbs up, the um, controller kicks in. That was the um, angular velocity. Here's a similar thing for lateral acceleration. And then this is the uh, braking that is applied. So now that the controller is in there and it's selectively uh, triggering the brakes to keep it, uh, be to reduce the acceleration 
it's uh, lowering the speed quite a bit. Let's see, where's my speed? Ah, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> yeah, so the, so the result of this is that it does slow down because that's kind of the only surefire way to uh, stop the rollover. Okay, now the rest of the presentation are examples in the area of ADAS and autonomous vehicles. Now here's an example uh, that is, this was made in our previous release. Notice we have walking pedestrians that are moving. Uh, events are being used down here to stop the car, wait for the pedestrians and the bicycle to clear it, and then speed up. Now I want to show a few other things, so I'm going to kill that and go live again. Okay, we'll look at the same uh, example here. And I, I want to talk through it a little bit more. So we see that we have two pedestrians waiting here. Neither of them are moving. They're both showing realistically standing. They're not like walking and frozen. Now the woman starts walking. The guy starts walking just a little bit after she did. They're walking at different rates. He's going to catch up with her. As they're walking, their feet touch the ground and stick to it. They're not doing any Michael Jackson moonwalk kinds of move. They're maintaining that realistic motion. When the bicyclist comes around and she turns, she's leaning into the turn. The lean is uh, physically correct. It's V squared over R is the lateral acceleration divided by G. Take the arctangent of that and you get the, the lean angle. The other biker keeps going straight. When everything is cleared, we go past the, uh, uh, in, through the intersection. We see the blue beam connecting with a speed limit sign up there. So it's changing the speed uh, used by the controller in the car. Now it detects the bike. And you see that it's uh, going to give her some respect here, moving to the left to give some clearance. OK. Go to the another example here showing a new feature. This is uh, traffic signals. And we'll take a look at the existing one first, which is not what we ship. It's uh, one that I modified. We have uh, three lights up here. We're looking here at vehicles going south. The straight road is uh, north-south. We're, the Ego vehicle is coming from the east, driving west. There's a red light facing us and a green light facing south. You see the blue detection right there. It's seeing both of them. Now that's not good. It's going to get real confused because uh, we wanted to only see the red one. And in past version, we put some invisible objects in there to block it. But we have a much cleaner solution now in 2019.0. We'll look at the traffic lights here. So this is the uh, data set used for all three of the traffic lights. They're just located in different places. And so we've got uh, where it's located using symbol stack things so it's uh, reusable. The type of shape is a cylinder. In all the past versions you had two options, a cylinder or a rectangle. Now we have two more. The segment one is what we intend to be used for signs. And this has a limited visibility angle. If I say 40, that means that its whole field, kind of a field of view from the, the object side, from the target side, is 40 degrees. That's 20 degrees on each side. So if you are facing the stop sign, you can see it. If you're within 20 degrees of facing it, you can see it. If you're more than that, you can't. And, uh, I said stop sign, I should have said traffic light. So if you're within 20 degrees of facing the traffic light, you can see it. Otherwise, you don't. So we'll redo that run. Look at the video. Now we don't see the green ones because we're more than 20 degrees away, but we do see the red ones. Now you notice that those uh, traffic vehicles are slowing down pretty realistically there. That's another big improvement we made with this release. 
We also see that the traffic vehicles following our, this is our blue Ego vehicle, that they slow down, and then when it speeds up because the light is turned green, uh, they follow it well. Also, look at where the rear wheels are. When our driver model tries to follow the dashed uh, blue line there, that it keeps the center of the front suspension pretty much on that line, and the rear wheels track inboard due to off-tracking. The rear wheels are trying to follow where the front wheels are. And that, that just comes from the physics of the vehicle dynamics. These other vehicles don't have full-blown vehicle dynamics. This is not a car sim model. This is a moving object. But it's tracking realistically. The front wheels are following the dash blue line. The rear wheels are tracking inboard. The cycling that we have for the light is real easily changed. Uh, a whole cycle is normalized to be one. I had it at 0.7, I'll change it to 0.4 and rerun it. So here we have some speeds. The control for our lead vehicle here was uh, smart enough to know that it has to come to a stop if it's a red light and it can keep going if it's a green light. Uh, because it's acceleration control, if the thing switches, it doesn't have a discontinuity. It means continuity by staying within reasonable acceleration limits. And now we have the red light over here. These guys stop um, in a physically believable manner. And then when it changes to red, they all accelerate to follow it. So that's uh, two examples that we have, and I've got uh, two more. A request that we've had for quite a while, especially from Japan, is to be able to have walls uh, to the side of the vehicle. So here is an example. So we see that we have our Eagle vehicle here, it's blue, a motorcycle that's red, a white vehicle, uh, a wall, and an access road over here with a, a dump truck, I think. The, the ray that goes from uh, a sensor that's kind of where the rear view mirror is here to uh, see the wall, it's blocked by the white vehicle, so it's, we're, we've got the occlusion going on there. And now we get to a point where uh, the wall is no longer blocking the view of the of the truck here, so we can see that. And you notice that uh, the wall is curved a little bit to follow the road. And as we go further, there's another wall, and this has a more dramatic curvature. We'll go up and see what this looks like. Looks like this. The green around here is what the internal model thinks that the target is shaped like. The uh, the stuff, the, the building with the textures is just eye candy. As we go through here, we see that there's a vector connecting the column. Uh, it's seeing the correct traffic light. Now we get some pedestrians. It can't see the pedestrians because they're out of view of the building. But now it does see them. Uh, if we had a rectangular building, the corner might have blocked them, but it's irregular, so it's got a clear view of the pedestrians. One goes to the crosswalk, one comes towards us, and over there in the background is the moving irregular object that is a bus. Those uh, three examples, or four examples that I showed, are using our built-in target objects that may move, may not move, can move or be stationary with controls for handling them. And our built-in sensor that is using just uh, 3D geometry to calculate a vector to uh, from the sensor location to the closest point on the object and then uh, about 20 other variables that uh, you might be interested in. 
A completely different way of doing this is to use the visualizer. Now our visualizer is showing a full 3D world. It has things that are transparent. It has the walking pedestrians with their arms moving, gaps between the legs. If you're going, if you have a big truck and a sports car on the other side, you can see the car underneath the truck. Uh, we can have multiple cameras, so we can have as many views of these as we want. And the, uh, the feature we put in a couple of years ago is an API so that you can share those camera views with other software. And what we're looking at on the right side here, the left image is Visualizer. The right image is coming from Simulink. Down here on the bottom, you see a, an icon that says, that has the picture, the car sim icon on it. It says live video. That's our vehicle dynamics. There's another one here on the left, and that's a, a plugin for Simulink that interfaces this camera view with um, Simulink's signals in Simulink, and you can use the image processing uh, toolkit in Simulink to do calculations. What we're sharing is an array of everything that you see in the camera with, for each pixel, RGB values, red, green, blue, distance, and a vector normal. And you can access this with uh, several kinds of tools. This is a pedestrian. Um, when we play it, we see the icons down here. The animator sets up. We run this under the control of Simulink. It's a little bit slower than real time, but not much. And now this is all Simulink uh, showing us what we're seeing here. The identification of the pedestrian is with the Simulink uh, library routines. We look at it again, moving. So left is the visualizer, right is the pedestrian. There's a rudimentary control in here to not hit the pedestrian in this uh, Simulink model. Now, a neat example that we've added in the 19.0 release is to do this without Simulink using Python. So in this case, the visualizer is uh, providing a camera running the same example I showed earlier with the bikes and the pedestrians. But instead of having our built-in simple sensor model, it's got code in Python that is processing this. So now, go ahead and make the run. It just generates the things, uh, the, the files, starts our visualizer, then you go into a Python environment, give commands to start the run. We're running CarSim from Python, and it's making use of a library called TensorFlow from Google that's uh, open source. So this identification is not done by us, mechanical simulation, it's done by TensorFlow, uh, an example from us. And Jeremy is keeping me honest here. That example, uh, it, because it involves open source stuff, we don't have it in our installation, but we have it on our website. So you can download the example and you have to install Python and TensorFlow yourself, but then you can run that. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about is how we're getting these scenes built. The ones I've shown you so far were made using the standard road building tools in our products. But uh, there's been a lot of interest in being able to make more complicated intersections and road geometries and represent things that are in the real world. So a year ago, we added an interface to our, uh, our GUI and browser called the Scene External Import Screen that can bring other data in and get it into car sim or truck sim or bike sim. The first tool that we had is called the Atlas web page that's on uh, car sim website gives you access to Google and here mapping services. Now here's an example that has been edit, speeded up and edited so I can show it in a few minutes, uh, where we take a, a real intersection outside of Ann Arbor uh, from I-94 to Jackson Road. We find it over here. This is Google Map showing us what the intersection is like. Now we'll go into Atlas and zoom in and find that same intersection in Atlas. We're using Google Map here, and Google is wanting to give us directions, so we use the interface of having a green start point and a red end point. But instead of getting directions, we click a button that says Download, and it's grabbing GPS and altitude data that we can import using that screen. Now, it's also 
giving us a reference point where 0, 0, 0 in our uh, XYZ coordinate system is. We add some animation real quickly to get the bare minimum. And this is uh, what we just downloaded. OK. Now we want to do the whole uh, exit here. So we'll move the endpoint, force it to take the exit, download that, import it. The box is unchecked to generate a reference. So this is going to use the same uh, GPS coordinate system that we had previously. So the XYZ coordinates from this should match the coordinate system from the previous one. And uh, we'll make one more here showing the local road. This is Jackson Road. Uh, we can adjust those points as we need. Download that. Bring it in. Add some animation effects. And now we'll see the three sections. And we hope that they're all connected properly. We run the simulation just so we can view it. Now we see that they are located correct if you were looking from above, but the Z coordinates need something to be leave something to be desired. We have editors in here, so we can see that the problem here is that where I-94 went over Jackson Road, Google gave us this altitude for the local road instead of the, uh, the overpass. So the quickest fix is to just take out the bad data points, which we do here. And then we can also improve it by using built-in uh, filtering options. So we'll do some smoothing in here to get the interstate to uh, look, get rid of, of some of the noise that comes from importing GPS data. For the local road, you see there's a little bend at the end there that we don't like. Uh, I think it goes into someone's driveway. So we'll take those points out. That looks better. We do the same thing with the uh, with the exit. Now we have the three roads that have been cleaned up a little bit. Still not much in the animation uh, sophistication, but this looks very good. We can use these for realistic simulations. It's pretty easy to add uh, animation assets using our built-in. There's a wall separating the lanes on the expressway. We've got grass on the side, um, double yellow line on Jackson Road, the right number of lanes. And then if we take our assets that are in here, like crash barriers, and use variable width rows, we get the exit that starts out as a single lane. It widens to two lanes. You can only make a left turn or a right turn. There's paint on the road. That's built in that we can uh, you can select from those. It changes from asphalt to concrete, back to asphalt. We've got the overpass and the ground under it uh, kind of showing what it looks like. So uh, this was provided in 18.1 with a 33-page memo. We've improved the interface a lot, so it takes much less time to do this with 19.0. You start out with something that you find from Google Map or another, uh, another viewing service, go into Atlas, and end up with something that's in car sim, truck sim, or bike sim. So Atlas is one tool. Uh, the other service that we support is here. And besides using Atlas to get access to here data, uh, they have an ADSRP database that they provide. If you have it, we have a plugin that works with that. We have a scene builder tool that we added a year ago that I want to show next. And this is the direction that we're going for making complicated scenarios real quickly. We'll go and show this. It has tiles that are in here. It's strictly drag and drop. You move them over. You can make as many uh, copies of it as you want. You can rotate them. You make paths very easily by connecting the dots, where the dots look like uh, little arrows here. So we go marching along. I've made a new path here, and I can get SL coordinates or XY coordinates just by moving a cursor over there. I'll write down the X and Y coordinates where I want to put some uh, a stop sign and some people. So this is kind of abstract. And now you see that when we do a video preview, this is a, an urban environment that's pretty complicated. These are the x and y coordinates where I want to locate a stop sign. These are s and l locations for locating a pedestrian. Now 
And so this is what we end up with. This is uh, real similar to what we saw earlier with the uh, walking pedestrians and the bikes, except we've got the nice detailed urban environment here. When we introduced the scene builder, we provided documentation. So if you have artists on staff, you can make your own custom assets. Um, and with 19.0, we've added compatibility with Open Drive uh, files. I'm going to show how you do that real quickly. Miscellaneous Open Drive. Go up here and do uh, scene builder. So this, this is a live thing. We have tiles for highway, rural, transitions, standalone. This is M-City. If you want to get M-City in here and want to build paths, we've got hundreds of points here to connect uh, paths and make them easy. Uh-oh, how do I get rid of that? We've got our animated things, our environment things, signs. We'll go back up here to Open Drive, drag it in here. And I'll add a path in Open Drive. We'll start here. It's a very confused path, but you'll get the point. I'll stop it, call it Mike. I've got to export it. Okay, so here's the one that I just imported. Run it. And view it. And so here we are, we've got the lines and the uh, textures. I know I'm running late, so we'll go kind of See the whole thing in there? So we do support uh, importing Open Drive now and getting complicated things from there um, pretty simply. Now the there is one complication. These graphic engines like Unreal uh, are top level programs. It's, uh, it, it doesn't plug, you can't plug, sim, you can't plug it into Simulink. And Simulink does plug into MATLAB, but MATLAB doesn't plug into anything. So you can run Simulink as a high-level program, or you can run Unreal as a high-level program, uh, but neither one of them can plug in. So if they're going to work together, that has to be through co-simulation using TCP IP or UDP to communicate between them. Carson can plug into either one. You plug into Simulink, you've seen that many times. That's over here on the right, method two. And then we have to have something else that plugs into Unreal. Or over here on the left, we can have Carson plug into Unreal, and then we have to have something else that plugs into Simulink. Well, the something else is called VS Connect, and that manages the communication. I'll show in the next slide here is method one. We will run with Carson uh, plugging into Unreal. Now, the nice thing about when it's plugged in, we have a very fast communication rate. So we'll be getting information from the ground at a kilohertz. So the tires are getting really updated information. Simulink is only communicating when there's a frame refresh, which is about 60 hertz. We're doing a simple ADAS, or a simple uh, adaptive cruise control here. So the blue car is following the red car. The controller is getting updates at 60 hertz, uh, which is enough to do that. The tires are getting updates from the ground at 1,000 hertz. So we've got, this is our, our method of getting Simulink and uh, Unreal working together. Now after you showed that, some of you uh, with trucks said, how do I do truck sim with this? And is there a faster way to, can I have the vehicle model communicate with Simulink faster and Unreal faster? So we've completely redone it for 19.0. Instead of having the car sim plug-in, it's now the vehicle sim dynamics plug-in. It includes three 
uh, three parts. CarSim, the complete CarSim uh, model and all, all the things that CarSim supports. TruckSim and all the models it supports. And uh, VS Connect. We've also changed the architecture, the way we communicate with the ground with a new API called VS Terrain API. And it's uh, being generic here. It can uh, get high frequency input regardless of where the vehicle model is. And we don't care how many tires there are. So that lets us support truck sim and car sim with trailers. Here's an example, and I asked them to make an example that was something we couldn't do with Visualizer. So it's a real dramatic lighting here, big shadows. It's got reflections. And the thing that we want to look at is the tires that when we go on an uneven surface, they're behaving just as they would in any other truck sim simulation. There's no unwanted uh, craziness or vibration. So this ground is all created in Unreal. The truck sim is the same truck sim that you would be using uh, at any time. Agradecemos aí a apresentação do Michael e mais uma vez agradecemos a presença de todos. Lembrando que este webinar vai ficar disponível para vocês e nós estamos à inteira disposição aí por e-mail, por telefone. Então fiquem bem à vontade aí para nos contatar e tirar suas dúvidas, certo? Abraço pessoal, até mais.